Good afternoon. My name is Mark Mason, RN, with the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs in Oregon. Uh, and I'm here today sharing our success in vaccinating American Indians and Alaskan Natives against HBV-related cancers in the Warm Springs Indian Health Service service area. Uh, I have no relevant financial in, uh, relationships within the past 24 months uh, due to the information I'm pre presenting today. Uh, so, a little information about Warm Springs. Uh, there's a that's a reservation in Oregon uh, with a population of around 4,000 individuals and 6,000 actual enrolled members of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute tribes. The Warm Springs Reservation includes 640,000 acres in Oregon um, from Mount Hood to the Deschutes River and is comprised of three districts, Sanasho, Agency, and Siksiqua. Uh, now, one of the great things about the clinic here in Warm Springs is it's the care home model. It's a one-stop shopping for most of your wellness needs. Um, and that refers to a facility in which patients can have all of their basic health care needs met under one roof. At Warm Springs, we have primary care, lab, pharmacy, optometry, dental, radiology, WIC, women's infants and children, uh, community health, a licensed clinical social worker, uh, community health representatives, a diabetes program, a registered dietitian for the diabetes program, uh, and a podiatrist all in-house. We also have regularly scheduled clinics with specialists that travel to the Warm Springs Health and Wellness Center regularly to see our community. Uh, I should probably add a disclaimer that this is this information relates to non-pandemic strangeness because things are operating a little differently than they normally would currently, of course. Uh, so I'll, I'll say straightforward the information that I'm sharing today, you know, my efforts in this knowledge are built on the extensive work by the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health uh, Board and tribal health coalitions that did some focus groups in 2015 to determine areas that they needed to really look at. Uh, combined with constantly evaluating my own approach and interaction with patients and um, the, their parents, uh, and I'm lucky enough to work in a position with a clinic that has worked hard over the years to build a close trust-based relationship with the community we serve. And I'll say that is the first and foremost thing you need to have, and it does take work. So currently, the, the things that I work on and um, promote to, to increase our vaccination rates and HPV uptake are um, I do bi-monthly VFC vaccines for children immunization audits and reconciliation as well as due letters. Uh, so, and again, normal times. Um, I'll print and send due letters for all of our pediatric, pediatric patients every 60 or so days. Um, this is more than just printing and sending the letters for each patient. I'll pull up their chart, uh, ensure they haven't gotten the shot since I did print those that stack of uh, letters. Uh, and pull them up in the state immunization uh, database to make sure that they haven't been getting immunizations elsewhere. If they have, I update that information in our charting system because it doesn't talk to us. And then I will reprint the due letter if they're due for anything and send it out. Uh, the process might not be necessary for you if you have an electronic health record that the state database can talk to. Uh, Ours, ours just does not, but we do send information out to it. So it will update for other clinics in the state. Um, we also do schedule appointments for updating immunizations. Um, I have my own schedule normally that I'll have patients come in and see me just for immunizations and also try and get them scheduled to see providers to do you know, well child visits, et cetera. Um, but sometimes all they're interested in is getting their immunizations and we will get what we can get. Um, but we do accept walk-ins um, here in community health. Uh, and I also partner with the WIC department to update their patients, primarily pediatric, um, that come in for WIC visits and are due for immunizations. Normally, we're not going to see that um, patients that are WIC eligible that are due for HPV. But if they have other children that aren't actually on the WIC, um, sometimes they come in with the parents. Um, so 
Also, I partner with the IHS Medical Clinic because we here in Community Health are separate. We're run by the tribal, um, a, a tribal department as opposed to federal. And when they have a high volume of patients in the, on the medical end of the building, and you know they, they have patients that need immunizations, they'll call down to me and ask if I can take those patients and complete their immunizations after the provider's seen them. Uh, if I'm not predisposed, I will say yes, they'll send them down and I'll run it just like a normal immunization visit um, and get them updated and get them going. Uh, now, one of the things that's really neat that uh, was done here in Warm Springs in 2017, the Warm Springs Community Health um, Action Team, Chet, and the Warm Springs Prevention Team partnered with Oregon Health and Science University and utilizing a grant, they were able to have posters made. These posters uh, advocating and normalizing HPV vaccines as cancer prevention for adolescents or adolescents were made utilizing local children. All of the children on these posters live here and are from Warm Springs um, in the photos. And it also incorporated local insignia of the Confederated Tribes, the three teepees. Uh, and, you know, these were all put up in the local Warm Springs kindergarten through eighth grade academy uh, where kids would see it and it would get that idea more that it's a cancer than some kind of sex vaccine that a lot of people have that misinterpretation of. Um, and that um, seemed to be a really successful program in taking some of that stigma out of the, the HPV vaccine. Um, so some things that you might want to look at to, to focus on in your own HPV vaccine program um, to, to, that, that we've, we have looked at are things like focusing on the successes of the vaccine. Um, if you have access to information that can show um, what the rate of HPV related cancers and precancers are in your area before the vaccine was made available. And since if there's been any kind of improvements um, in your area or country, push that information, let them, you know, the parents and family know like, hey, this has been successful. This is what we had before we had this vaccine. This is what it's looking like now. Uh, normalize it. Uh, talk about it like a cancer prevention vaccine not a genital wart vaccine. Uh, use direct terminology. Tell boys or men that it will prevent penis cancer. Uh, tell girls or women that it can prevent cervical cancers, which in addition to being potentially fatal, can also cause them not to be able to have children if that's something that they someday want. Um, involve your patients. I always start out my, pay, my visits with asking the patients um, or the parent if they have any questions or concerns about the vaccine that that we we're discussing that day. Uh, and that puts them in the driving seat and focuses the visit on their care and not what we need to do to complete the visit, get the shots done, chart it, and move on to our next patient. Um, you know, it's very patient focused care. Um, and currently, um, Warm Spring starts patients at 11 with HPV 9. And um, at that age, Children that way or uh, that age want to be treated as as important as they are, and are right at that age where they need to be learning about advocating for and taking care of themselves. Their shots on the pot, uh, or their their thoughts on a potentially life saving treatment should be considered as important too. And so, talk to the at the preteen or teen. Tell them all the things you would tell the parent, but direct it at that patient. Um, involve them, make them feel like they're actually important because they are. Um, if the parent is insistent on the child not needing the vaccine because they aren't having sex or are worried it will make them sexually active, use a bicycle helmet analogy. Do you put your bike helmet on before you get on the bike or do you put it on right before you wreck your bike? You want to put it on before you get on. So even if the child isn't going to be having intercourse for decades, let's, let's get them protected now so there's a non-issue. We all know sex isn't always planned <clears throat> and scheduled thing, especially among teens. Um, cultural awareness, be aware in the community you serve of any concerns or history that may have taken place that might affect the, the view of 
the vaccine that you're offering. Um, specifically, um, so the Northwest Portland Area India Health Board found in interviews with parents and grandparents they were skeptical of the vaccine for many reasons, including not knowing enough about it, afraid of side effects, um, historical mistrust of the medical system, mistrust of the federal government, being that IHS is a federal um, facility, and also indigenous peoples have a terrible history of having their women forcefully sterilized. Um, and there's fear that the vaccine was created to do that. So be aware of things like that if there's something going on in the community or the culture that you're serving. Um, be aware of missed opportunities. Um, I'm not immune to this. I have had patients where I've gone back and done audits and seen that I missed an opportunity to offer a vaccine because they were there for something else and didn't think about it. Um, if they're there for well child checks, um, ER follow-ups, sports physicals, direct observed therapy for STIs, um, birth control, gyn visits, all of those are legitimate reasons to also offer those vaccines. Um, and, you know, looking to the future with HPV vaccines, especially in light of the COVID vaccines right now um, and the initial success that they seem to be having, what are the possibilities with, with vaccines using the mRNA technology? I'm pretty excited to see where we go, not just for HPV, but other things. I've actually seen um, recently one of the CEOs of one of the current vaccines was talking about targeting cancer with this technology next, not just HPV. And that's an amazing thing that we can hopefully look forward to having advances in. Um, and that's really what I've got today for you. If, you know, I, I hope you enjoyed this information and it helps you in serving the community that you serve and increasing your vaccination rates. Have a wonderful day. Hello, I'm Linda Veet from Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, and I have no disclosures. Today, I will be talking to you about a unique partnership to encourage colorectal cancer screening in public housing residents. As you can see from the pictures on the screen, Upstate and Upstate Cancer Center are the immediate neighbors of a large public housing development right in the city of Syracuse known as Pioneer Homes. Pioneer Homes is one of the oldest public housing developments in the United States. It's operational and it's been fully occupied since 1940. Because of the proximity of Upstate and Upstate's mission to serve the community, we knew we needed a better relationship with our neighbors in public housing and needed to address the health disparities that they suffer from. We know people in housing often lead, lead challenging lives. And because of this, they don't always address their health concerns right away when something easily can be treated. Upstate, as the academic medical university in the region, feels a responsibility to change this way of thinking. In 2010, Upstate Medical University and Syracuse Housing formed what we call the Healthy Neighbors Partnership. The Healthy Neighbors Partnership has the goal to address health disparities in this underserved population. One of the very first things we did was a needs assessment to see what the health issues of the residents were and what they were most concerned about. From this needs assessment, we found that cancer, specifically breast and colorectal cancer, ranked high on the list of concerns among people in public housing. The model that we developed to educate and screen residents in housing for colon cancer was a peer-to-peer -peer approach. Through collaboration with the Housing Authority, we identified residents who lived in housing who would be good role models, almost stars in the community. They are people who are well respected by their peers. We call them peer advocates or resident health advocates or RHAs for short. They are very similar to community health workers, but in this case, they live and work in public housing and serve their neighbors and friends. We have 10 resident health advocates in total with six focused on cancer screening. All resident health advocates are trained by upstate health professionals in all health topics for eight weeks in general 
And then an additional four weeks of specific training is done for whatever the diseases we're studying. And in this case, it's colorectal cancer. We call our colorectal cancer screening program the We Matter program, and it's trademarked as such. We were able to start the We Matter program in 2016 under the Healthy Neighbors Partnership umbrella due to a generous grant from the Prevent Cancer Foundation. The money was used to pay stipends to the RHAs for the work they do, and it also funded the educational sessions we did by paying for the lunches during the Lunch and Learns and small incentives for people such as branded We Matter t-shirts for the participants who get screened for colorectal cancer. The We Matter colon screening program focuses on education and screening for colon cancer with the goals to increase knowledge, decrease fear, increase screening, and assist with navigation in the health system if anything worrisome is found. The peer advocates, or RHAs, work under close supervision with the program coordinator and do activities with the populations, such as lunch and learn presentations, playing colon cancer trivia, tabling at health fairs, barbecues, neighborhood events, community events, going door to door to educate all and encourage people to be screened for colorectal cancer. One of our RHAs, Janet, in the lower right-hand picture, the woman with the longer, darker hair, has an interesting story. Janet developed breast cancer in 2014 and was helped by another one of our RHAs. After the good experience she had with our program, she decided to become an RHA herself and give back to the community. Janet is now one of our star RHAs for colon cancer. This table shows the success of our efforts and the success of the partnership. Since 2016, we have educated over 2,500 people in housing across eight public housing developments. Of the 2,500 people educated, over 1,100 are 50 years of age and older. And it's this group that we target for screening with either a fit kit or with a colonoscopy. We found that people are more accepting of the fit kit. From 2016 to 2019, we used a three sample kit and had a return rate of 25%. In 2019, we switched to a one sample kit and the return rate increased to 50% in this traditionally hard to reach population. In the approximately 100 people that were screened through We Matter, three had polyps removed that most likely were precancerous. We continue to run the We Matter program with great results and a wider acceptance of screening in public housing residents and beyond. The RHAs or peer advocates have become well-versed in colon cancer facts and do a great job with getting people educated and screened. The RHAs and the program coordinator are definitely the keys to the success of the We Matter program. We will be replicating this program in the rural and Hispanic communities in and around Syracuse. For anyone who is thinking about developing a community cancer screening program, one of the very first things to do is a needs assessment to see if the targeted population is concerned about colorectal cancer and if they're accepting of the screening that goes with it. Another very important aspect of developing a program is getting buy-in from leadership and stakeholders. In our case, the Upstate President's Office, along with the Cancer Center leaders, understand and support the program with many in-kind donations of staff time. We have a great relationship with the Executive Director of Syracuse Housing, which is very important in gaining access to the population and building the all-important trust, as well as helping to provide space to run the programs. A strong project coordinator is essential as is funding for the peer advocates. 
Branding the program is also important because people want to be associated with something bigger. We Matter has become a movement in public housing and one in which people are proud to be a part of. We see public housing residents wearing their We Matter shirts proudly in the community and people are beginning to tell us when they're due for their next screening. Now that's behavior change. Continuous engagement is what has made this program successful. Thank you, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Norma Gómez. Soy promotora de salud aquí en la organización del proyecto Mixteco Indígena. Estamos colaborando con Probation Cancer Foundation y University of California en Los Ángeles. No hay conflicto de interés de mi parte para este, esta grabación. Antecedentes. Se estima que hay más de 200 mil indígenas mixtecos, zapotecos, triquis, mexicanos aquí en el condado de Ventura, en California. Muchos trabajadores son de la agricultura. Muchos de ellos hablan español y otros hablan en su idioma indígena, mixteco y zapoteco. Dado que ha sido difícil realizar encuestas en una comunidad sin lengua escrita, hay poca información sobre las necesidades de la comunidad indígena. En nuestra organización es Sin Fines de Lucro, fundada en el 2001 aquí en Oxnard, California, en el Condado de Ventura. Tenemos más de 20 programas de entrenamiento de liderazgo, educación y alcance. Trabajamos en colaboración con escuelas, salud públicas, y otros. Prohibemos servicios de interpretación, referencias, talleres y referencias a agencias. Entrenamos a líderes indígenas bilingües como promotora de salud. Métodos. Cuatro módulos de una hora. ¿Qué es cáncer? ¿Qué podemos hacer para reducir el riesgo? Cáncer de seno y mamograma. Visitas completas para las mujeres. También hicimos cuatro PSA de 10 minutos grabados en Mixteco. Se refirió referencias y navegaciones a visitas médicos sin costo. Promotoras entrenadas para realizar 48 talleres de una hora sobre prevención de cáncer a 500 participantes en Mixteco y español. Tuvimos evaluaciones básicas pre y post. Aprendizaje. Factores a considerar para mejor la prevención y el acceso son horarios de servicios durante los fines de semana o después de las 5 de la tarde, interpretación en la lengua indígena mixteco y zapoteco, tener una doctora para hacer el examen de detección en las mujeres, entrenar promotoras bilingües para alcanzar educación sobre prevención del cáncer, Utilizamos medios sociales como radios comunitarias. Hicimos PS6 radios novelas en mixteco y zapoteco. Desarrollamos material, materiales visuales. Incluimos hombres en los entrenamientos de prevenir de cáncer de seno. Servicios médicos de prevención de cáncer de bajo costo. Colaborar con, con escuelas saludes públicas para coordinar referencias y talleres de educación. Prevenir es vencer. Gracias, Shavington. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Luz Amparo Pinzón. I am a public health education, communication, and research strategist. I am honored to serve as your moderation moderator today. I do not have conflicts of interest relevant to today's meeting. I would like to thank the presenters of this session for providing such interesting information about their community level uh, programs. But before starting our dialogue, I would like to uh, remind the audience how they can participate. So 
You can ask questions and comments in the Q&A tab of the engagement tool located on the right of your screen. And the questions will be moderated. We will try to get to as many as your question as the time allows. So let's get started. Okay, uh, this question is, um, I'm going to, uh, this question is for Linda actually. Uh, Linda, based on your experience, what are the adaptations or challenges that you are envisioning in the next phase when reaching Hispanic, Latinos, and rural populations? So, yeah, that will be a challenge for us. I think um, having the language uh, barrier could be an issue for us, for the Hispanic population. That's why we have partnered with a a uh, La Liga um, organization that's in Syracuse. So hopefully that will help bridge some of the language issues that we may have. Um, as far as the rural population, I think it's just going to be a challenge to get to the sites. Syracuse is, is a, a city uh, in New York State, but we have many, many rural areas that could be up north as far as four hours from us. So I think this just the geographic spread uh, actually could be an issue for us. Not one that we can't handle though. Fantastic. Yeah. So the next question is for Mark. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about the impact of your posters that you displayed in schools in terms of normalizing the conversation about the vaccine that prevent cancers opposed to the sex vaccine? Um, absolutely. Uh, so with with those posters, the having local um, preteens, teens in them um, and the local imagery of the confederated tribes made it a little more personal to to the local population instead of you know a, a shotgun blast of cdc's um literature that's just kind of broadly associated to everyone um it it brings it home more to the 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 people here um and having it in the schools kind of got the kids looking at it and asking about it and thinking about it some um so I, to be honest, I started here mid 2017, just after that had been initiated, you know, putting them up. So I have not personally seen what the, the impact was prior to that. Um, I can tell you that since, since being here, I now have far fewer people treating it or looking at it um, as suspicious or as a sex vaccine that is going to make their kids have sex. That's, that's a, a, something I have to address less often than I used to. So uh, anecdote doesn't equal data, but I have a feeling that those, those things and the other efforts have been successful in normalizing that um, for for the, the population here. Great, Mark. I have a question from the audience, actually, that is related with that. It says, uh, before the pandemic and a school closure, my program used to host vaccina vaccination clinics at schools. Teens were able to get the HPV vaccine on site during the school hours. However, it has been hard to promote the vaccine and educate teens outside the school. Any suggestions? Uh, to be honest, I don't. Our, we just, I just did our quarterly rates um, for January, February, March, um, and they dropped again uh, across the board for us. The pandemic has really put a dent in our immunization rates, which were fantastic across the board prior. Um, but having, we had, we had a large caseload of COVID here 
in uh, the area back in November, December, and we put a hard hold on immunization visits across the board for that time until those came back under control. So we also used to do you know, like, you know, flu shot clinics at the school. Um, you know, we, we would have, like I said, walk-ins. Um, yes, we'd schedule them, but you can just walk in anytime. Don't need an appointment. We'd get your immunizations. That, because of the pandemic and restrictions and safety, et cetera, it really has um, impacted. And I have not figured out an easy answer other than time. <laughs> We're going to have to wait for the vaccine to do its work for the the majority of people to get immunized and hopefully see these numbers dropping um, and and the ability to have more frequent um, patient visits with not as many hard controls like we've had to have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Norma, esta pregunta es para usted. Arce, Arsenio, thank you, Arsenio Lopez, thank you very much for serving as her interpreter today. Could you please tell us about the outreach strategies that you implement in order to reach isolated population, such as farm workers, by using face-to-face -face intervention? So, ¿Podría contarnos, Norma, un poco más acerca de las estrategias de alcance y divulgación que usted aplica para llegar a las poblaciones aisladas, como por ejemplo los trabajadores agrícolas, mediante estrategias e intervenciones de cara a cara? Sí, este, pues nosotros lo que estamos haciendo con nuestra comunidad es ir a los campos, más que todo, este, hablar sobre las, lo que está pasando, lo que tenemos en, en programa, por decir así, como por ejemplo, uh, lo que está pasando ahorita. Tenemos, estamos este, haciendo va varios este, programas de radio o, o PSAs de radio en nuestro idioma. Estamos este, hablando con la comunidad donde nos los encontramos. Entonces, tenemos varias estrategias que, que usamos con nuestra comunidad. So yes, uh, of course, um, the way that we conduct outreach is by going in the field where farm workers work um, uh, using the promotoras models um, uh, who speak the indigenous languages um, and also some other strategies that we use. We use our community radio stations that, uh, where we record PSAs uh, on providing um, crucial information like for right now, during the pandemic, for example, um, information that's being recorded is related to that. So that's kind of the strategies that we use, like in person, in the workplace, but also using uh, community radio stations as well. Okay, thank you. I have another question related with this. It says, how has the pandemic impacted your cancer prevention information in the indigenous community? Could you please? Como um, la pandemia ha... Oh, perdón, discúlpeme. ¿Cómo ha, ha impactado la pandemia la información de prevención de cáncer en la comunidad indígena? Pues este, ha afectado mucho porque pues ahorita no es como antes de que podíamos ir al doctor uh, de persona en persona o no podíamos... Este, a alcanzar a la comunidad de persona en persona, de puerta a puerta. Entonces, ahorita sí se ha estado afectando porque hay personas que ahorita solamente nada más estamos como encerrados, por decir así, sí. pero también a la vez pues las personas están ahorita trabajando en el campo. Entonces, este, para muchos de nosotros trabajadores del campo, pues no hubo encerramiento, sino que tenemos que trabajar y llegar a casa. Yeah. So yes, it's greatly been impacted um, at the work um, that we do in terms with cancer prevention because there's a lot of um, limitation to have access to health and related to like in-person visits or scheduling any appointments. Um, everything becomes virtually. Um, basically, we're working from homes. So many of us uh, doing the outreach. Um, the uh, Zoom is not like the same as it was before, like in-person outreach uh, and education. 
Um, and as well, you know, we know that farm workers are essential workers and are working in the fields, but with a lot of, uh, you know, um, lacking a lot of information by not being able to have that in-person outreach. Um, and basically they work and just pretty much that do their best to just keep themselves isolated and just be informed, not really like leave and, and try to do more like in-person stuff. Thank you. Linda, this question is for you. In your presentation, you mentioned the importance of creating a brand for anyone thinking about developing community-based uh, programs. Could you please tell us a little bit more about the advantage and the strength of having a brand? Yes, I, it's very important to have a brand to your program. It's something that people can relate to and it's something that people can be proud to be a part of. So we termed and entitled our program, We Matter. It's after actually our very successful breast cancer screening program, which is similar called She Matters. She Matters is our breast program. We Matter is our colon cancer screening program. So it's very relatable. People understand it. They see We Matter out in the community and they're proud to be a part of it. We have t-shirts, we have branded giveaways um, that have the We Matter logo on, and it was really important to trademark that logo for us as well. So I think it's something that people can identify with and it's almost, it's almost become a movement that they're proud of. So I think that's why it's really, really important to brand your program. That is fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, Mark, um, uh, the cultural awareness we know that is uh, in implementing community-based uh, programs mm -hmm. is a crucial in overcoming attitudes, beliefs, and practices among the population that we are servicing. Uh, so how you have overcome the issues that you mentioned in your presentation for example, the lack of trust in the health system. Well, so like I said in the, the presentation, the Warm Springs Health and Wellness Clinic has been here for over, I believe over 30 years and it is, they've worked hard. Um, Dr. Krillman, who's one of our most senior staff members here he has been here i believe over 35 years in this community um he used to work uh, uh here under u.s health service he retired from there came back as a private physician to continue working in this community um and often you'll come in uh, if you came in on a saturday you'd find him working on stuff so he has put a lot of time and effort and everyone that has has been here has done that so that trust is something here that has been ongoing. Um, for me, um, working in it with an indigenous population was new when I started here. Um, for myself, personally, I have worked really hard on my own personal growth and awareness. And um, I am constantly trying to talk to my, my the, the community members that I work with and ask them like, how do you, how does this impact you? I want to know their input because they're the one serving. Um, and also, you know, specifically in Alaskan, uh, Indian, Native American, um, I've, I've looked more beyond what, you know, I learned in school and I've <laughs> looked to find more information about how, um, these populations were treated and really where they were before, where they are now and how we got there and what I can do to serve and help, you know, repair that um, okay. and help them become healthy. Thank you very much. Uh, this question comes from uh, the audience for Norma. ¿Qué recursos educativos usa para los hispanos habitantes que son fáciles de leer y entender en español? ¿Qué organizaciones conocidas tiene buena información al respecto de cáncer? Pues este, que los recursos que son buenos para nuestra comunidad o para la comunidad hispana es hablar 
de tú a tú con la persona, ser tú, yeah. estar presente tú y hablar con las, con las familias o las personas. Entonces, eso es lo, el buen recurso que podemos tener, uh, como por ejemplo para nuestra comunidad indígena, tener este visual, volantes visuales, tener este, uh, cosas visuales para nuestra comunidad, pero también lo mismo es de tú a tú en su propio idioma, en su propio lenguaje, para que ellos comprendan y entiendan de lo que se está hablando. Pues, y sobre este, qué este, organización tiene más buena información con respecto al cáncer, pues voy a ser este, egoísta, creo que va, voy a ser la organización de nosotros, el proyecto de porque este, hemos estado colaborando con UCLA y ellos nos han dado información que uh, ellos piensan que es bueno para la comunidad, pero como nosotros estamos trabajando con nuestra comunidad indígena, tenemos que adaptarlo a nuestra comunidad. Um, the first thing that I, I will say is that uh, I think there is nothing that we can compare by uh, having a one-on-one -on -one interaction with communities and education in terms with cancer. Um, people that speak the same language and providing that information, speaking in the language, uh, it's important. Um, in terms with organizations that um, has the best information related to cancer, I will be a little bit of a um, uh, selfish, but I will say that our organization has been doing uh, works around education and outreach and um, collaborating with UCLA, uh, where um, we have developed materials that, um, with the support of UCLA, um, materials that it's easy to understand uh, on, and, and put it in the concept that our community is uh, it's easy to absorb and understand. Um, going back a little bit, um, I think the other way to, um, that is important to provide information to our communities about um, cancer is about having visual materials. Uh, if it's going to be um, uh, written or flyers, it's important that it uh, has a visual component to it so uh, our people get that information. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I, uh, as the time is, is short in here, I would like to jump and ask you, the three of us, um, in two sentences, or if you can, in one, could you please give advice to uh, organizations that want to implement community level intervention? Anyone can start. So I would say the most important thing is to establish the trust factor. That by far is the absolute most important thing when you're doing any kind of community work and getting uh, community buy-in and stakeholder engagement is probably equally important. And Mark? Um, I would say don't lose sight of the community and the patients that you're serving. Um, it may be a paycheck, but it's it's about who you're, you're the, the community you're serving, first and foremost. Okay, thank you. Norma, I believe Arsenio already interpreted the question for you. Sí. Yeah? Yo creo que más que todo, primero que todo es observar o ver primero con quién comunidad están trabajando. Uh, es lo primero y también es este tener como personas que hablen en su mismo idioma eso yo creo que básicamente es lo más importante es ver con qué comunidad estás trabajando eh, hablar en su propio idioma y tener y saber la cultura o la tradición de esa comunidad con quien están trabajando I think wow. it's, it's very, thank you thank oh, you very much Luis I need to translate that yes um, I think it's important that um, they look into the communities that are, that are serving. What is that diversity that exists? Based on that, it's important to be conscious about language access, providing the services in, in the linguistic manner, and also learning about the culture and tradition of those communities. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, as we wrap up, I would like to thank the speakers for their presentation and for participating in the discussion today. 
Also, on behalf of the Prevent Cancer Foundation, I would like to thank all our attendees and participants for taking part of this first web webcast of the 2021 Virtual Prevent Cancer Dialogue. Please be sure to respond to the satisfaction survey as soon as you receive it in the email. I also want to thank our generous sponsors, Exact Science, Grail, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Hologic. Please be sure to join the Prevent Cancer Foundation for more dialogue on May 5th and June 2nd, as we are looking for more innovations in cancer screening. You can sign up on the conference homepage. So for now, have a great afternoon, everyone.